Starting today, my Patreon live streams will be every day until paper two, and I'll even run a few before paper three. I'm planning to do 20 hours altogether. These live streams are available to everyone at signups level and up. If you're interested in joining me for these revision sessions, grab a pen and paper and download all the 2022 AS and A-level past papers from AQA's website. I've combined and summarized the content from my social influence videos into this revision video. If you don't understand any of the content I cover here, go to my longer videos for a full explanation. Or if you just need a reminder of the key points quickly, this is the video for you. But don't just use this video. I have a Psych Boost app. It's designed to test your knowledge of all the topics in A-level psychology actively using flashcards. It's on iOS and Android, and you can use it for all of Paper 1 for free. If instead you want tutorial support videos with questions from all three papers, you can access over 16 hours of these, as well as hundreds of printable resources, over on my Patreon. But enough of that, let's get started. Conformity, Ash. Kelman, 1958. Three levels, types. Compliance, shallow. Identification, intermediate. Internalization, deep. Type, compliance. The individual agrees externally, but keeps personal opinions. A temporary behaviour change. As the individual changes their behaviour to fit in with the group, avoid rejection, compliance is generally due to NSI. Type, identification. Behaviour and private values change only when with the group, as membership is valued. Type, internalisation. Personal opinions genuinely change to match the group, a permanent change due to ISI. Explanation, normative social influence, NSI. Driven by desire to be liked and avoid rejection, the individual wants to appear normal and be one of the majority. NSI is a superficial and temporary change in behaviour. Explanation, informational social influence, ISI. Driven by a desire to be correct, we look to the majority for guidance on how to behave when correct behaviour is uncertain, assuming others have more knowledge. Permanent. Ash, 1951. Groups of 8-10 to 10 male college students were asked to complete a line judgement task. However, this was a deception. Only one was an actual participant, and all others were Confederates, actors, working for the experimenter. All participants were asked to publicly identify which of the three comparison lines matched a standard line. In 12 critical trials, the Confederates intentionally answered incorrectly to see if the real participant would conform. Results. The overall conformity rate in the critical trials was 32%. 75% conformed at least once. 5% all 12 times. Group size. Ash varied the number of confederates from 1 to 16. Found 3% conformity of 1, 13% with 2, 33% with 3 confederates, and no large percentage of more. Suggests a small, unanimous group has a strong social pressure. Unanimity. One confederate was instructed to give the correct response, breaking the group's unanimity by disagreeing with the majority. Ash found the conformity rate dropped to 5.5%, due to social support. Task difficulty. Ash made the task more ambiguous by reducing the difference between the line lengths. Finding the increased uncertainty increased conformity, arguably due to ISI. Evaluations. Ash's original research supports NSI, as 75% of participants conformed at least once, despite the correct answer being unambiguous. Participants conformed because they wanted to avoid the discomfort of standing out or being rejected. In a variation, in which participants could privately write down their responses, the conformity rate dropped to 12.5%. The variation in task difficulty increased the ambiguity of the correct answer. When participants were more unsure of the correct answer, they were more likely to rely on the judgments of others. This supports the ISI explanation. It can be difficult to separate the influence of NSI and ISI. When participants self-report their reasons for conforming, people may not be fully aware of their true motivations. In real-life ambiguous or uncertain situations, individuals might simultaneously seek accurate information, informational influence, and social approval, normative influence. As a lab experiment, Ash's study has high internal validity. It was carefully controlled, and standardised procedures were followed. Participants viewed the same lines in the same order with the same responses from the Confederates. Perrin and Spencer, 1981, suggest Ash's work lacks temporal validity. That high conformity rates were due to the cultural conditions in Cold War America. In their application with British students, they found conformity in only one trial in 396. In a meta-analysis of 133 studies using Ash's line judgment task across 17 countries, Bond 1996 found support for Ash's original findings, 
but also much higher rates of conformity in collectivist cultures, which have social norms that prioritise consensus, compared to individualistic societies that value independence and personal freedom. Ash's task lacks mundane realism. Matching the length of lines is a simple task and highly controlled, so unlike real-life social interactions... Additionally, conforming often happens with people we know, not with total strangers. Conformity social roles, Zimbardo. Fake prison created in the basement of Stanford University. 24 male students rated as physically and mentally stable, chosen from volunteers who responded to a newspaper advert. Random allocation of guards and prisoner roles. Prisoners were given a realistic arrest by local police, fingerprinted, stripped, deloused, and given a prison uniform, a number and a list of rules to follow. Guards had complete control and given a uniform, clubs, handcuffs to establish authority, and sunglasses to avoid eye contact. Zimbardo took on the role of prison superintendent and lead investigator. Participants quickly adapted their behaviour to their assigned social roles. After initial resistance, prisoners showed signs of stress. In day six, the experiment was cancelled early due to fears for the prisoners' mental health. Extreme abusive and submissive behaviour of previously stable students suggests prison environments have the situational power to change behaviour as individuals conform to socially defined roles. Evaluations The Stanford Prison Experiment's initial setup was well controlled. Participants were carefully selected using psychological screening to ensure their mental stability. Additionally, the roles of guard and prisoners were randomly allocated. Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment provides insights into how social roles can influence behaviour, which can help explain incidents of cruelty and abuse in institutional settings. For example, the guards in Abu Ghraib performed highly abusive behaviours. Reichler and Haslam's 2011 replication of the Stanford Prison Experiment for the BBC challenged Zimbardo's conclusions by demonstrating that participants do not inevitably conform their assigned roles of guards or prisoners. Zimbardo took on a dual role as the lead investigator and prison superintendent. This involvement may have led to experiment bias. Zimbardo's presence influencing the participants' behaviour to fit the expected outcomes of the study. Participants experienced psychological harm. Zimbardo's decision to continue the experiment despite the emotional breakdown of the prisoners and the extreme sadistic acts of some guards demonstrates the need for ethical controls. Explanations for obedience, Milgram and Adorno. Milgram argues that in the right situation, most people will show destructive obedience to an authority figure. Agentic state. State of mind in which the individual believes they don't have responsibility for their behaviour as they're acting as the agent of an authority figure. This allows the individual to commit acts they morally oppose, seeing the authority figure as ultimately responsible. The movement from an autonomous state, feeling personally responsible, to an agentic state is called an agentic shift. Legitimacy of authority. Through socialization, individuals learn their position in the social hierarchy and to obey people who are above, but not below them. Most people accept the legitimacy of authority is needed for society to function properly such as the right of police or judges to give orders. Legitimacy of authority is communicated through visible symbols, such as uniforms. Settings, such as police stations, centres of government and courts, can also communicate legitimacy of authority. In response to the Holocaust, Milgram, 1963, conducted a study to test extreme obedience. 40 male, 20-50-year-old to 50 year old volunteers to a newspaper advert for a study on memory. Participants were given the role of teacher and introduced to confederates, a professor in a lab coat and a learner. The learner was strapped to a chair in another room and had electrodes attached. The participant was told to deliver electric shocks, becoming more intense, 15 to 450 volts, when the learner answered incorrectly. At 300 volts, the learner made noise and refused to go on. After 315 volts, the learner made no more noise, indicating unconsciousness or death. If the participant, teacher, resisted, the professor encouraged them to continue using a set of four scripted prompts. If the learner refused to continue four times, the study ended. Results. Participants very distressed but obeyed. 100% to 300 volts. 12.5% stopped to 300 volts. 65% to full 450 volts. Proximity. Professor gave instructions via a phone, increasing distance. Obedience dropped to 21%. No agentic state. Location. Our office block in rundown area, instead of Yale Uni. Obedience dropped to 47.6% due to lack of legitimacy of authority. Uniform. Professor replaced with confederate in normal clothes. Obedience dropped to 20% due to lack of legitimacy of authority. Evaluations. Milgram's research supports the agentic state. When questioned, the experimenter accepts responsibility for any harm to the learner. 
The scientist in the uniform, lab coat, had legitimate authority in the location of Yale University. The manipulation of these variables supports Milgram's conclusions that agentic state and legitimacy of authority do influence obedience. Milgram's research support for the agentic state and legitimacy of authority is criticised for methodological flaws. The task, using a shock generator, lacks mundane realism, and the study's environment of Yale University lacks ecological validity. Orn and Holland, 1968, claim the task was so unusual that participants figured out they were not actually shocking anyone and acted to demand characteristics, guessing what Milgram's aims were and acting accordingly, so not supporting agentic state and legitimacy of authority. 35% resisted the authority figure, suggesting situational factors, agentic state and legitimacy of authority, are not a full explanation of obedience. Dispositional explanations, authoritarian personality and locus of control, likely play a role. Standardised procedures, such as pre-recordings of the learner's responses, led to high level of control, and enabled replications. Blass found Milgram's findings were reliable across eight countries. Non-US obedience rate, 65.9%. Milgram's study and variations are criticised. Ethically for causing distress, deception. Methodologically for lacking ecological validity, mundane realism, and for demand characteristics. Participants guessing the shocks were not real and playing along. Hoffling, 1966. Against hospital policy, 21 out of 22 real nurses obeyed Dr. Smith's phone call order to give double the maximum dose of an unfamiliar drug. A field study in a real hospital, high ecological validity, with a familiar task, high mundane realism. Sheridan King, 1972. Participants gave real shocks to a puppy, seeing the puppy suffer. When ordered, 54% of males and 100% of females gave the puppy the highest shock level. Showing without demand characteristics, people are highly obedient. Bickman, 1974. New York field experiment. Passers-by were asked to pay for a parking meter, and the obedience rate was 89% when the researcher was dressed as a guard, 33% no uniform, suggesting uniforms provide a visible symbol of legitimacy of authority. Authoritarian personality. Adorno argued the high obedience in World War II was dispositional a personality type called the authoritarian personality. Unlike Milgram, who said with the right situational factors, we're all capable of extreme obedience. People with an authoritarian personality have their obedient personality shaped early in life by strict parenting with harsh physical punishments. The anger they feel towards their parents is displaced onto minority groups. People with an authoritarian personality have high respect for people with higher social status, leading to obedience, are hostile to people they see as having low status, and have fixed stereotypes about groups of people. Adorno, 1950s, studied the authoritarian personality with a questionnaire called the F-scale, fascism scale. Questions on the F-scale measured nine factors, including authoritarian submission, an uncritical attitude towards authorities, power and toughness, preoccupation with dominant submission, identification with power figures. Evaluations. In Milgram's study, 35% resisted the authority figure. Adorno's theory acknowledges that the willingness to obey an authority figure can vary from person to person, explaining why there are extreme variations in Milgram's participants. Elms and Milgram, 1966, found obedient males in previous Milgram studies scored significantly higher on the F scale than disobedient males, suggesting they had authoritarian personalities. They trusted the professor and dehumanized the learner. Alternate situational explanations of obedience, the agentic state and legitimacy of authority, are backed up by experimental research. This research by Milgram, Bickman, Hoffling shows the majority of people are highly obedient. The F scale is criticised as a measurement of an authoritarian personality. For example, it suffers from acquiescence bias. People tend to agree to questions. The F scale was written in a way that agreeing to all the questions would artificially inflate scores. The authoritarian personality theory can lead to stereotyping, where complex historical events such as the horrors of World War II are oversimplified into personality flaws. This approach risks reducing the accountability of social structures and leaders. Resistance to social influence. Hey there, as you're still watching, I'm guessing you'll find this video useful. As I release content right up to the exams, don't forget to subscribe so you know when new videos are uploaded. Social support. Seeing others resist social influence reduces the pressure to obey or conform by increasing the individual's confidence. Resistance to obedience. A disobedient role model challenges the legitimacy of authority of the authority figure and shows the consequences of disobedience. Resistance to conformity. 
a non-conformist ally, dissenter, breaks the group's unanimity and creates an alternate group to belong to. In a variation of Milgram's study, two additional Confederate teachers provided social support. One of these teachers refused to continue at 150 volts, and at 210 volts, the second teacher refused to obey. The obedience rate dropped to 10%. In Asher's unanimity variation, one of the Confederates provides social support, breaking the unanimity of the group by providing the correct response, and the conformity rate drops from 32% to 5.5%. Even in the Milgram and Ash variations with social support, some participants still obey 10% and conform 5.5% conformity rate, suggesting there may be dispositional factors such as locus of control or the authoritarian personality. Locus of control, Rotter 1966, a personality scale from high internal to high external. Locus of control refers to the factors people believe control their actions. People with an internal locus of control see themselves as responsible. This personal agency enables them to resist social influence. People with an external locus of control see factors like fate, luck, or powerful others as controlling their lives, so feel less empowered to affect change in their lives, and less able to resist social pressure. Holland, 1967, replicated Milgram's study. Participants were assessed for internal or external locus of control. 37% of those with an internal locus of control refused to continue to the highest shock level, compared to 23% of those with an external locus of control. Spectre, 1983, measured 157 participants' locus of control and tendency to conform to normative and informational social influence with questionnaires. People with an internal locus of control were more able to resist normative social influence, but were just as likely as externals to conform to informational social influence. The relationship between locus of control and resistance to social influence is correlational. There are other related factors that have been suggested as being involved in resistance, such as social status, social anxiety, and a sense of personal morality. Minority influence and social change. Minority influence requires individuals to reject majority behaviours beliefs and to be converted to the views of minority. Consistency. Minorities are more effective if members of the minority repeat the same message over time. Diachronic consistency. All group members repeat the same message at the same time. Synchronic consistency. Commitment. If the minority suffer for their views, this shows they are not acting out of self-interest. Members of the majority reconsider the minority's motivations, augmentation principle, and take their position seriously. Flexibility. If dogmatic, minorities will not be persuasive. They need the ability to appear to consider valid counter-arguments and slightly compromise. Flexibility encourages majority members to move closer to the minority position. While flexibility and consistency seem to contradict each other, in order to seem reasonable and open-minded, as well as having a clear, stable opinion, there needs to be a balance between these two factors. The snowball effect. Minorities changing majority opinions starts as a slow process. However, the process speeds up as more of the majority convert to the new view, and the minority view improves in its acceptability. Evaluations. Moscovici, 1969. When shown blue slides, members of a participant majority were more likely to report the slides were green if a confederate minority was consistent in calling the slides green. 8% of trials. But if the minority was inconsistent, 1%. Nemeth, 1986. When a confederate minority was inflexible, arguing for a low level of compensation for a ski accident, a free participant majority were less likely to change their amount closer to the confederate figure than if the confederate was flexible. Lab-based studies investigating minority influence are conducted on artificial groups, making decisions without real consequences. However, minority influence in the real world is often with friends and co-workers, with real consequences. There are many real-life examples of minority groups using commitment, flexibility, and consistency. See social change. Knowledge of how minorities can influence majorities can be used for unethical deliberate manipulation. This could be to forward negative political and corporate agendas, such as greenwashing and spreading fake political news. Social change is when a view held by a minority group challenges the majority view and is eventually accepted by the majority. Then whole societies, not just individuals, adopt new attitudes, beliefs or behaviours. Minority groups are more successful in creating social change when they show consistency, commitment and flexibility in their views. Gradually, the minority turned into the majority group in society due to the snowball effect. Obedience. Members of the government are a minority group 
that can enact dramatic social change by creating laws. When laws are created, societies change to avoid punishment. Conformity. Normative social influence. Compliance. Behaviours or views can become the norm within an influential minority group. This norm can then spread to broader society. Informational social influence. Internalisation. Members of a minority group can provide information to the majority, such as the effects of climate change. Society changes its behaviour because it accepts as evidence. Social cryptoamnesia. Once the mainstream accepts minority ideas and they become the norm, sacrifices made by the minority group in initiating the positive social changes are not acknowledged, but are forgotten over time. Evaluations. Leaders and activists in the civil rights movement were successful in taking a consistently unified front through non-violent protests, sit-ins and marches. They also showed commitment to their ideals when they suffered abuse at the hands of law enforcement. This led to significant social change, including the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act. The LGBTQ plus rights movement has used a combination of consistency in its core message of equality and rights, alongside flexibility, to influence social change. For example, the gay community successfully campaigned for civil partnerships, a strategic, flexible compromise that ultimately led to the full legalisation of same-sex marriage. Highly controlled experimental laboratory research on social change is not possible, meaning clear cause and effect relationships can't be established. Instead, researchers depend on natural experiments, case studies and correlations. Don't forget you can now test yourself on the social influence unit with the PsychBoost app. All the topics in paper one are free and you can get it on iOS or Android. If you want to see model answers to social influence questions or access my other resources, there's also Patreon. Speaking of Patreon, I do want to thank all of my patrons for their support. With the help of all of these students and teachers, I'm able to teach part-time so I can work on the main mission of PsychBoost, the development of a free-to-watch and, hopefully high-quality, A-level psychology course. And a special thank you to Azzy Taylor for supporting at the developer level. So thanks to them, and good luck with your revision, and I'll see you in the next PsychBoost video.